Well, I'm trying to use my new camera, but I, either the battery ran down or something. I can't get it to quite operate as well as I'd like. But we're going to do what we can. I'm playing with the lights here, trying to get... Anthony's not here to help me. He's off doing something, so... I won't have him around for a while. He's working. Good for him, making some money. But, uh... He's me. <laughs> I don't know any about this. I'm doing the best I can. So forgive me if it's not... But it's the Word of God, so he's going to handle it the best he knows how, and we're going to handle it the best we know how, right? So, the first, today's little video, today's video is entitled, Let's Not Put Christ Back in Christmas. You hear that? Let's put Christ back in Christmas. No, he never was there. Now, you won't hear a lot of preachers tell this story, uh, but... Listen to this. This is kind of interesting. See, back in uh, in Ephesus, and back in the uh, what do you call it? Um, Jesus appeared to John in Patmos. That's the word I'm looking for. Back in Patmos, Jesus appeared to John, and among other things, he gave him seven letters one to, to be delivered to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And these churches, uh, not only did they get individual letters, but put them all together as a group and you have a, a, a prophecy by Jesus of the roller coaster ride that the church was going to take for the next 2,000 years. The appearance the church would take to the world, the kind of way people would look at the church and how the church would act is reflected in these seven letters. The first one was to Ephesus and Ephesus was the, typifies the first church and they went and didn't have too hard a time. They fell in love with the message of Jesus Christ and they embraced the salvation in Christ. They embraced it. So, um, they, 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 that's how they were saved. They accepted the salvation. But Jesus had a little complaint to make in his letter. He says, go back to the way you felt at first. Go back to your love. Go back to the way, you, the, the joy of your salvation. In the last few years, you started substituting your good works for your faith. Hey, it's your faith that saves you. Your good works will be reflected through your faith, but don't make the works more important than where you started out. Don't do that. That's his first letter. Second was to Smyrna. And poor Smyrna, the word myrrh is encased in words, and this is the name of the town Smyrna. And myrrh is a, an unguent, a spice used in burials, and it connotates hard times. And so the church of Smyrna represents. The, the church that was persecuted under Rome, under well, first the temple of Jews, and then later, more especially Rome and Nero and all that stuff, and the lines and the Colosseum and the, and the crucifixions and the beheadings and all. They did a lot of the terrible things. Five million Christians died during the 200 year period between Nero and Diocletian, the last emperor to oppress the church. Five. Five million of them. Let's say five. Five million of them. That's a lot of people. More than I'd have died these days across the world in China and, and Arab countries and other countries in Africa. More Christians have died than five million already. And it's just starting. The persecution of the church is just starting again. But we're talking about Christmas. So the second letter was to, to Smyrna and Christ said to him, I have no complaints to make about you. I know how much you're suffering. I know what you're going through. I know I'm with you. You think you're poor, but you're so rich in me. I, I take note of everything you're doing and everything that happens to you, and you are rich beyond your wildest dreams. You're rich. And then the second church, the third church came to Pergamus. Pergamus is down the road a little bit, and it was right after. The, the time of Roman persecution finally ended and Constantine became emperor of Rome. Now Constantine, some say he was a Christian. Most don't think he ever was, but he might have. I'm not judging Constantine. So Constantine, but he did one thing. He legalized Christianity, made it legal to be a Christian. And so as a consequence, the Christians could go to church openly, work in the government. And he liked Christians. He hired a lot of them, put them in government jobs. 
that was okay. See, Pergamus is a, the city of Pergamus. The word Pergamus is made up of two Greek words, per meaning two, and gamos meaning marriage. We use it still today. We say bigamous. There's two marriages, a big gamos. So pergamos is also two marriages. And the church became married to Jesus and then married to the state. The state started to have influence that church decisions. Government officials started to come in and say, why don't you do this? And why don't you do that? And people at Pergamus, but see, Christ also made excuses for them. He says, Pergamus, that's where Satan keeps his throne. That's where Satan's seat is, is in Pergamus. I know you've been through terrible oppression, not physical oppression, but spiritual oppression in that town. And, and so you're in Pergamus, but Fight your way through it, pals. And the next one down the line, the next letter was to Thyatira. Thyatira, well, by this time, it was a little bit after Constantine was dead, and Theodosius became emperor. Theodosius, not only allowed Christianity to be legal, he himself was a noted Christian. And he did something very foolish. He did it from, the, from his heart. You see, we don't, when let God do it, it's going to be right, but we think we're going to help God well. <laughs> oh, yeah, we think we're helping God. He says, you've got to be a Christian. It's now mandatory that everybody in the emperor, in the empire, rather, has to be a Christian. Thousands, if not millions of pagans to keep their jobs and to keep their living going became Christians, and they all came into the church. En masse. And they brought their pagan beliefs with them. But they weren't Christians. They were just members of the church for other reasons. So they came in and they brought it. And pretty soon we had saints' names being given to the old gods and demigods, had days of holiday, and they became saints' feast days, St. Patrick's Day and St. Joseph's Day and St. whatever day. And one of those feast days was the winter solstice. Since the time, since Noah's ark landed on dry ground, dry ground and the sun appeared and everyone in those days thought the sun was God. And so they worshipped the sun. And a guy by the name of uh, Nimrod and his wife Samarimus, his wife, wife, queen, sister, mother, whatever else she was, but she was a lot of things. She high priest the whole thing and they built the temple they built the what do you call it, the ziggurat the, the tower of babel and they built a new religion which is still a false religion all over the world all the false religions in the world are all hinged on the ideas these this team came up with and anyway they they took the winter solstice the 22nd of december from the sun apparently dies because it's the shortest day of the year so the sun's dying the gods die oh but then three days later, oh, it's apparent the days are starting to grow longer in only a few seconds, but God's coming back. That's why in, in ancient uh, Germany, old Germany, and it's come to us through the German princes that married into Victoria, married a German prince, Albert. And they brought the Yule log over to Britain and you cremated the old God in the, in the grate. On Christmas Eve, you burned a Yule log and that's the old God being cremated and gone. Then the next morning, the kids would get up and there'd be a brand new young Christmas tree decorated with silver. Oh. Merry Christmas. And all that became, oh, and that's how, and Samara and Nimrod invented this holiday. And Satan, he has access to the, he has access to the councils of God. We know about that. Job told us in Job 1, let's see if I can find that right now, see if I can get there. Job 1, Job 1, if I can find it, if not, then we'll go without it, but it'll come up. Uh, Job 1 anyway. Job 1, he said, oh, here it is. The one day the angels came to present, 1, 6. And one day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. So he's in, listening to all God's plans. Now, God plays his cards pretty close to his chest. But the general outline of his plans, so Satan picked up somehow that three days was important to the to the Messiah. It's going to be something in the Messiah's life in three days. So he put it in the birth 
December 25th, 22nd was the death, 23 days later. Oh, the resurrection, oh, son. We know later, it's a different story. But, uh, uh, and, and by the way, if you want to have yourself a Christmas tree, go for it. There's nothing wrong with a Christmas Even Jeremiah, who was the first to say, don't do like the Babylonians, don't do like the pagans. Don't do it. But listen to what he says, Jeremiah 10, one, uh, 3 through 5. He says, the custom of the people are vain. They cut a tree in the forest with the work of their own hands. And then they deck it with silver and gold. And they fasten it with nails. So it stands like a palm tree, but it doesn't speak. And if it wants to go someplace, it has to be carried. So don't be afraid of it. It cannot do you evil, and it cannot do you any good. But if you want to have a Christmas, I'm not, this is not Jeremiah's me. If you want to have a Christmas tree, go for it, have a Christmas tree. It's all right. Worst things could happen, Christmas tree. But know what it's about. It's not about not celebrating the birth of Jesus. So we have got to get to that because Jesus was not born on December 25th. And we're going to find out today exactly when he was born. And the Bible's going to tell us. Look, he's going to tell us, not me. So here we go. So what about Christmas? Well, let's figure it out. Now, the first thing Luke tells us in his book was tell us about the birth of John the Baptist. Not Jesus, John the Baptist. Oh, wow, oh, why did that? Well, let's see what it says here. It says Luke 1, 24 and 26. And after these days, Elizabeth, that's John's mother, Elizabeth, his wife, Zachariah's wife, conceived. And now in the sixth month of Elizabeth's conception, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city in Galilee named Nazareth. So now we know that John's mother Elizabeth was six months with the child when Gabriel appeared to Mary in Nazareth. So the only question now is, when did Elizabeth conceive? If we can figure that out, then we've got the birthday of Jesus. It all follows through. Okay, so let's go. Let's do it again. And our first clue in this mystery comes again in Luke. Luke 1 5. It says, And there was in the days of Herod the king, Judea, a certain priest, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abijah, and he had a wife of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Oh, yes. Zacharias and Elizabeth have got teamed up, all right? And we are told then that both Zacharias and Elizabeth were Levites of the priestly farm family of Aaron, and they discovered something. We discovered something else about them. They had no children because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well stricken in years. It sounds sort of like Abraham and Sarah, doesn't it? And that's the same thing. Abraham and Sarah were old cautious with no kids. Elizabeth and Zacharias and Elizabeth were old cautious with no kids. Same thing, just about. But look was about but but God was about to fix as he fixed Abram and Zerah, <coughs> he's about to fix and he's about to fix Zacharias and Elizabeth. Look one through uh, chap, uh, verse eight says, Now it came to pass that while he, Zacharias, was executing his priestly office before God in the order of his course, then an angel appeared to him to him. Anyway, told him that Elizabeth was pregnant. Oh. But here we have a first clue, a first vital clue. It says here, Zach Zacharias was in temple in the order of his course. Now, what does that tell us? Well, to find out, we have to do you know, movie making. If you want to go back in time and catch up with what happened before an event and then come up to the event, we call that a flashback. So we're going to do a flashback to the time of King David. You see, David was faced, a young king, and he was faced with a huge problem. By the time from Aaron's time, the father of the priestly families, to the time of David, it was a few hundred years, quite a few. And a lot of, a lot of Aaronites 
had come along and they all wanted a gig in the temple because they were all qualified. They were all, and they all wanted their job. If you put all the Aaronites, all the children of Aaron in the temple at the same time, they wouldn't have any room for a congregation. All the priests would get them. <laughs> all the priests were, ooh, it's going to tell them. Anyway. So you can see the problem, but David came up with a solution. David divided the priestly ranks into 24 separate divisions or courses. And then he appointed each course a specific time in the religious calendar. Two weeks every year. And this way everyone could have a goal at serving the Lord. So you'd all have your little gig in there. Oh, everybody. Oh. But you had to do it in the order of your course. So this is how it went. This is how First Chronicles 24, 7 through 19. And the first lot fell to Jeho Jehoiarib. Jehoiarib. I'm not very good at pronouncing it. Jehoiarib. And the second to Jedaiah. And the third to Harim. And the fourth to Siorim. And the fifth to Malchijah. Malchija, and the sixth to Midjamin. And the seventh to Hekos or Hekos or Hakos or whatever it is. And the eighth to Abijah. Eighth. No only one you have to remember is Abijah, number eight. The rest of them, don't, don't worry about them. They're in the Bible, you'll look them up. But remember Abijah, number eight. That's the one. And we know that the last, the first thing we're told is Zacharias was in the temple when the angel appeared to him in the order of his course, and his course was Abijah. Ooh. So when did that happen? Well, don't panic. This is dead easy. All you have to do is follow the bouncy ball. All right, just follow. And we'll get the whole thing. Well, simply put, Passover begins the Jewish religious year. It's a variable feast with no set date. Sometimes it's in, in early, in late March, and sometimes it's in early April. Sort of like Easter, huh? Sort of like Easter. So let's pick a date at random. No, no, we can't be more than a week or two off, about one week, maybe. 10 days off. Either way, I don't know said it was just a general target. We're not pinpointing right now. So pick on, let's take an easy day. First of April, right in the middle. <laughs> See them. Could be, could have been the first of April. It might not be, but we'll say the first of April on the year that John was conceived. So in that event, the order of David's priestly divisions would have gone something like this. The first of April to mid-April would be division number one, Jehoiarib. Mm -hmm. And from mid-April to the end of the month is number two, Jedaiah. And from the first of May, we'd bring in number three, Harim. And mid-May, we'd see number four, Siorim. And the beginning of June was the time number five, Malchijah. And mid-June, number six, Mijamin. Early July brought in number seven, Hakos. So in the last half of July, along bopped number eight, the course of Abijah. They were being called. Zechariah was on call. So now we know that when the angel appeared to Zechariah announcing the conception of, uh, of Elizabeth's conception, it was in the last half of July of that year. Give or take a day or two, a week. So, last half. So, now we know. And so, Luke 1, 11, 13 says, He's in the temple, Zacharias. And there appeared to Zacharias an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. But the angel said to him, Fear not, Zacharias, for your supplication has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Now, now we know that John the Baptist was conceived in late July. And remember, Luke told us that Jesus was conceived six months later. So add it up. And that makes the date of Jesus' conception to be sometime in late December. Possibly the 25th. Oh. And nine months later, along would come baby Jesus. Jesus wasn't any different from any other child who's ever been born. Nine months after his conception, he was born. 
And this coincides, and that means he was born late September, early October, which coincides with the Jewish Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah. Now, according to Shabbat.org, the Feast of Rosh Hashanah, which means the head of the year, starts the first of Tishri and begins the Jewish civil calendar. And Shabbat people also claim that that, that uh, this that, that this date, Rosh Hashanah, also is the anniversary of the creation of Adam and Eve. Now I don't know if that's true. They say so, and they may have information I don't have because I'm I don't know a lot. I know just what I know. What I know. I know the Bible a little bit. I know what God tells me a little bit. I'm pretty stupid sometimes. But anyway. anyway, so Rosh Hashanah, rather than Christmas, adds up to the perfect time for the birth of Jesus Christ for every major event in the life of Jesus Christ occurred on a Jewish holy day his birth his death rather his resurrection and so does his birthday Rosh Hashanah count on it Bible tells you so here are seven, and here's a couple other clues outside of the Bible that might help you support this proposition. And here's one of them, Luke 2, 7 through 8. And she, Mary, brought forth her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and she laid him in a manger. And there were shepherds in that same country, living in the field, keeping watch by night over their flock. Well, just about everybody's heard that story, but very few have tried thinking about it. The weather in Judea in late December is lousy. It's foul. Rain, snow, sleep, what have you. There would be zero chance of the shepherds being still in the field with their flock or without them. But in September, early October, no problem the shepherds were still in the field with the flock and that's the angels appeared to these lads in the field Luke 2 9 and 11 said and the angel of the Lord stood by them they were the first to hear the good news and the angel of the Lord stood by them and the angel said to them the shepherds there was born to you this day in the city of David a savior and he is Christ So it appears that our winter wonderland Christmas turns out to be just another satanic lie told to confuse the people and conceal the truth. Now, don't say, don't say, let's put Christ back in Christmas. He never was there. But enjoy the holiday, get yourself a Christmas tree, have a good time. And by the way, the Godmother, I mean, this is another festival, but not Christmas. Another, the Godmother, the Mother Goddess rather, goddess of fertility uh, celebrates her festival in the blush of spring and her name is Ishtar which sounds an awful lot like Easter Christ did not raise up in Easter he rose up in the Jewish feast of Trump at the feast of uh, uh, <laughs> offerings there. First offerings. He's a... Anyway, Christ's seven letters to the seven churches covered in much more detail. I'm finished here. Much more detail in the book Satan's War on You. And also check out Daniel's Five Alarm Warning to the Jew. The both books are available on Kindle, Amazon Kindle. Get a copy, give some to your friends for Christmas, for Xmas, Merry Xmas. Oh, and please subscribe and give us a thumbs up. And thank you. And like I said before, get yourself a Christmas tree and have yourself a Merry Xmas. And have fun. Get some presents and give some. Nothing wrong with it. It can't do you any harm. It can't do you any good, except it makes you feel good, but it can't hurt you. You know that Jeremiah told us that. So, God bless. Give us a thumbs up. Get the books. We need the money. <coughs> We're dying down here in Belize. We're old folks who went 
and we're doing the best we can. There was a little, little teaching going here. So God bless you, and we'll see you maybe next time.